Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Nestor, the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Ruby Receptionists. And I'm Steve Severance, VP of Engineering at Ruby. Ruby is a live, remote receptionist service, and our mission is to make real human connections in this increasingly automated and virtual world. We currently make these connections for 6,300 companies across North America, and we've been doing that for 14 years. We do this from three locations in Portland, Oregon, and two-thirds of our 400 employees are receptionists who are taking calls from our customers and hopefully delivering delight over the phone. So in Q1 of this year, that was about 2 million calls that we answered on behalf of small businesses. Um, as Steve said, we're a re remote receptionist company, so we're the face of a lot of small businesses across North America. That 2 million calls in Q1 translates to about 36,000 calls a day, which we see as opportunities to connect and deliver delight to both the callers and the customers whose calls uh, we're answering on behalf of. So can I see a show of hands here speaking of calls and businesses how many people here have um, the opportunity maybe or the misfortune of calling a company or a business in the last two to three months anyone make a phone call to a business okay now keep your hands up if that was a delightful or pleasant experience yeah just a few of you had your hands still up. And uh, while it's a bummer that it wasn't a good experience for you, it's actually also unfortunate for the uh, business itself um, because the phone communication is another important communication channel for you, and it does have a direct impact on um, your business's bottom line. 80% of customers um, say report that a positive phone experience is likely to make them a repeat customer. That's customer loyalty you're generating right there if you have a delightful experience on the phone. And 72% of customers will actually just hang up if they get an automated voicemail. That's potential new customers just walking straight out the door. So some of you might be wondering, can you guys hear me? Eh, okay, I'll stand over here. Some of you might be wondering why we spend so much time worrying about delivering delight over the phone. Why not Twitter or live chat? Well, think about if you do a Google search from your mobile device. If the search results contains a phone number, all you have to do is click on that phone number to make a call. That probably explains why 61% of mobile searches result in a voice call. And 47% of mobile users say that they'll move on to a competitor if a business doesn't have a phone number readily available. The, resurgence, the, the rise of mobile search is driving a resurgence in business voice calls. Last year it was 70 billion, and by 2019 it's projected to be 162 billion. So even if you're handling just a fraction of those calls, they're an important part of your overall channel communication strategy with your customers. So as you get, as those calls continue to come in, and as a, as a business owner, how do you deliver delight at scale over those calls? Now, Ruby, as Steve mentioned, has been in business for about 14 years, and we've scaled from a company of about 10 employees and 50 customers up to where we are today, which is 400 employees and 6,300 customers or more, just a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, we're at a different scale than some of the organizations that are presented. We're at a different scale than some of you may be in the um, audience. But we've gone through this journey of trying to maintain the delight and those meaningful human connections with every call as we've gotten larger. And so Ruby has something we call the Ruby Service Pyramid as our way of ensuring that as we grow and scale, we're able to continue to deliver delight to our customers. So the principles behind this Ruby Service Pyramid are simple. Think Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A person or a business needs a strong foundation that delivers the basics before that person or the business can reliably achieve their full potential. For most businesses and Ruby, that foundation is probably going to be around infrastructure. And for Ruby, that infrastructure helps us do what we say we do, which is deliver high quality, reliable calls. So now we've got kind of that more technology environment at the base of the pyramid supporting your organization as you move up. 
But another piece to the puzzle is actually the environment in which your employees work. Um, and so foster hap fostering happiness is actually a key part to this pyramid and being able to deliver delight at scale. Um, a lot of research into service design shows that the environment in which your employees work, the culture in which they work, actually has a direct impact on the quality of service that they deliver to your customers. So that fostering happiness is a pretty important part. And when they are in a culture that inspires them to deliver great service and motivates them to engage and connect with your customers, they're able to create experiences with your customers that go beyond just the transactions. And experiences are the types of things that stick with your customers and, again, drive more of that customer loyalty. Um, and that allows you to get a little more insight about who your customers are and what pain points that they are feeling. You have probably a good idea about what brought your customers to you in the first place, what need or pain point, but as you create experiences and as your employees are motivated to engage more with your customers, you can get some insight to anticipate needs and then deliver what they don't even know they want. And it's that unexpected uh, delivery of something that somebody finds pleasant or delight or joyful is what delivers delight. Um, and that's where you really get to making those human connections. Now the pyramid isn't something that we just did once and never looked at again. It's actually kind of a living thing. And even when you're operating at the top, making those connections, you need to keep looking down through the pyramid and making sure that all those layers are continuing to support you and your organization. So last year, we took a hard look at our infrastructure to make sure it really was helping us do what we say we're going to do. And what we found was digital PRIs, once the benchmark for voice quality, were working against us in today's mostly everything is SIP world. Here you see Ruby before we brought in SIP trunks. A call coming in from the PSDN is converted to TDM for delivery over our PRIs then converted back to SIP for transport on our internal VoIP network. Then if the receptionist live transfers that call to our customer, that's our stock and trade by the way, that call is going to be converted two more times. So it turns out our old benchmark was actually hurting our call quality. That's not quite the experience we were hoping to deliver for our customers. That foundation and those bottom layers of the pyramid were no longer supporting us. So that's when we needed to look at um, new providers and getting onto SIP from end to end. Um, so as we looked for a SIP trunk provider, uh, we were a little hesitant. Um, as Steve said, we hold our call quality near and dear to our hearts, and like a lot of companies that have contact centers or call centers, we had a lot of uh, routing and knowledge and smarts built into our PBX. So we needed to find a uh, SIP provider who could give us a SIP trunk to connect um, their services into our local PBX. In addition to that, we had a couple of other key criteria that we were looking at in a SIP trunk provider. First and foremost, we needed easy access um, to local phone numbers. Um, this is something we do every day for our customers. We need to be able to quickly provision and find local phone numbers in their area. We are also looking for a really robust dashboard and admin console so that we could easily add uh, capacity as needed or change routes as needed to you know, avert uh, any traffic that might be going uh, the wrong way. And lastly, we really needed to make sure that we had some layer of call quality or some additional things that we could do to make sure that the quality of service and the voice quality was great. So for us, that meant somebody who could provide MPLS on top of the SIP or underneath the SIP trunk. Um, and at the high level, in case anyone doesn't isn't familiar with MPLS, that's at the very high level. That's a way to ensure your call quality and making sure your voice packets all go together and aren't interrupted by other internet traffic. So we didn't look at every other VoIP pro or SIP provider, but we did look at several, and they didn't fare too well. One provider took a week just to provision one local number. Another provider, we kept breaking their administration console because we were trying to provision multiple numbers and have multiple people do it at the same time. Another provider took four months just to install the physical circuit in our facility, and then another four months to properly configure it. By contrast, Twilio really checked all the boxes. They were fast to set up. We had our proof of concept and calls flowing through it up and running within 24 hours. Twilio offers MPLS connectivity, which, and they have points of presence on both coasts, 
So that gave us geo redundancy and higher quality, more reliable calls. Twilio has a very robust admin console. We've had provisioned thousands of numbers and we have lots of people using it at the same time and we haven't broke it yet. <laughs> Give us a little more time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and of course Twilio has its programmable uh, number platform and its Elastic SIP platform and those are providing features that allow us to deliver products and services that no other provider could. On top of all that, Twilio turned out to be much less expensive. Twilio really helps us be prepared with the right infrastructure, and that is allowing us to do what we say we're going to do. So let's look a little bit more at um, where we go from here now that you've got that right infrastructure and you're able to do what you say you're going to do. So if you think about this as a customer journey, a customer experience that you've had with um, a company at some point, you've got those high points and those low points. And so I'd like you to think back to a time recently, imagine this, not imagine, but hopefully remember, uh, when you've had a great experience with a company, when they did something that really you remember and it was a really positive experience for you. Now, I'll think a little bit more about that and can you remember what the employee was like who you dealt with in that experience? Can I see a show of hands if anybody remembers that employee being pleasant, possibly even happy to do what they were doing for you? Okay, see a few hands going up. Um, like I said earlier, that's not really a surprise. Service design shows that that culture in which your employee works has a direct impact on the quality of service they're going to deliver to your customers. And so that's why fostering happiness is such an important part of the service period to get to delight in those meaningful connections. Um, cool, I, 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 must, I understand that, but how am I gonna engineer foster happiness? I mean. We're going to provide free beer or daily massages. Not that Ruby hasn't done that on occasion, <laughs> but I'm worried that this could get a little bit out of hand. Thankfully, it doesn't have to be that elaborate, as fun as that is. Um, one of the techniques that Ruby uses that actually has a direct return on investment is a um, simple campaign called the Happiness Journal. And actually right now is the time of year that we do the Happiness Journal. This is something that we've done four years running with our employees and it came out of a problem we were facing four years ago where we were not doing what we said we were going to do. In fact, we had about one in 1,000 calls had some kind of call handling or accuracy error, and that's just not meeting our standards. We tried a lot of different techniques, you know, standard sort of like, hey, rewards to the team who has the least amount of errors this week, or, you know, a, a reward for somebody who has a decreasing amount of errors over time, but none of those kind of standard motivational techniques really had any dent or impact on our error rate. Um, so we took a look outside of the norm and came across a uh, paper or book by a man named Sean Aker. It's called The Happiness Advantage. And in there, he has some research that shows that happy employees are not only more productive, but they're also more accurate. So to put that into test or to test that theory, um, we created the Happiness Journal. And for 21 days, uh, we ask our employees to list three things that they're grateful for write down a positive gratitude action for the day, and that's you know reaching out to somebody to say thank you, or um, reaching out to somebody you haven't spoken to for a while. And lastly, um, about a positive experience for the, for the past 24 hours. Amazingly, within six weeks of the Happiness Journal campaign, our error rates had dropped from one in 1,000 to one in 2,500. That's a 60% decrease. We've continued to the Happiness Journal campaign every year since, and it's really helped foster an environment where not only are employees happy, but they're motivated to do what they say they're going to do and deliver delight to our customers. So let's go a little further up and look at what comes next in the service pyramid. We talked about creating experiences and um, that fostered or that happy happily fostered environment um, is one way to make sure that your employees are motivated and engaged to do that but I'd like to focus a little bit more on give them what they don't even know they want and that's in the realm of anticipate anticipating needs so it's pretty hard to figure out what does your customer want that they haven't even told you um, but a lot of things you can have indications for based on their behavior or trends they're seeing and so you you know it's easy to generate hypotheses um, so you can uh, come up with some ideas about what your customer may need or want that they haven't expressed to you yet. Um, but that can obviously go pretty spectacularly wrong sometimes. 
I think we can all agree Clippy wasn't something anybody needed or wanted, um, but yet there Clippy was. Um, so one of the things that we hold near and dear to our hearts as well is that whenever we, we make sure we have an environment in which we can really experiment and validate quickly when we've got um, these sort of anticipated needs, hypotheses that we're testing. So to show you a little bit more what that looks like and how Twilio has been a great partner for us in testing some of these things, we'll take you through a quick little case study on um, a feature that we call Choose Your Caller ID. Uh, Jeff mentioned this actually in the first day's opening session that there's a bigger and bigger trend with businesses using personal cell phones for um, employees' uh, cell communications and the whole bring your own device um, sort of theme that's been running through, particularly with small businesses. And at Ruby, we noticed that too. Our customers were, fewer and fewer of our new customers were giving us a desk phone or a landline phone as their phone number, but more and more were just their cell phone number. And so we came up with a hypothesis that our customers wanted to use their cell phone for business, but really wanted to keep their personal separate from their business. So they didn't want to be making calls on, um, from their cell phone and giving to their customers or their partners or their contacts. Um, uh, their personal cell phone number, they'd rather give them their business number. So we created a feature called Choose Your Caller ID, which allows customers through our app to choose the number that they show when they're dialing out. So this is a mobile app uh, that relies on Twilio's programmable voice and a bunch of uh, s systems at Ruby's and Ruby's infrastructure. And Twilio really made this experiment possible. We were able to have a beta ready in a month and then we have the production version ready in another two months. So let's take a look at how we built that. We started with a pool of programmable voice numbers and some code on our systems that dynamically manage that pool based on demand. We use Twilio's REST API to buy, release, and configure the numbers as needed. Then on the mobile app side, Whenever the, when our customer initiates the Choose Your Caller ID feature, the mobile app performs a little setup activity by sending some data over to our systems. Mostly that's reserving a number out of the dynamic pool and then saving the recipient's number and the desired caller ID. Then our mobile app uses the mobile device's native dialer to initiate a call. The call is going to go out over the devices cell, cell carrier network, not a verse, as a SIP call over the data network. And we did this because we think it's a better user experience, both in terms of voice quality and for user expectations around call waiting if another call should come in. So once that call hits Twilio's programmable voice platform, it fires a webhook that reaches out to our systems, and then we query that previously saved call setup information, and we return to Twilio this very simple Twimmel. All it has is the number that the person wants to dial and the appropriate caller ID. And really, that's about it. We spent a lot of time developing code to track state and manage the size of the number pool, but when it comes right down to handling the actual call, Twilio really made it easy. I mean, you know, it's just an angle bracket and a verb. So as Steve mentioned that um, thankfully for me and the product team that had this as a hypothesis, it only took a month for us to build the beta. Um, so that's not too much investment if this wasn't something that customers actually wanted and we weren't anticipating a need. Lucky for us, it actually was something customers wanted but didn't know it. Um, so we launched the full version at sort of the end of December, beginning of January this year. We've had 77 or 70% month over month growth in usage and to date uh, customers have made 105,000 minutes worth, worth of calls where they choo chose their caller ID. Um, and it's not just the data that's telling us that our customers love it, it's actually our customers themselves. Um, you know, in fact, that first quote there, I appreciate the convenience of carrying just one phone and the ability to draw a line between personal and business activity. I mean, I could not, she could not have said it better if I had handed her the hypothesis that we were trying to test. So really, Let's just talk a little bit about and recap what we've talked about today. Um, so, so you can get to that point where you're anticipating needs and hopefully delighting your customers as well. First and foremost, we talked about having that right foundation. It's really important that your product or service 
can um, fulfill its basic needs and functionality before you start layering in all the other good stuff. Nobody's going to care how delightful communication is or an interaction with you is if your product doesn't do what it says it was going to do. And doing what you say you're going to do is a lot easier if you can partner with the right uh, technology partners and platforms like Twilio. And once you've got those things in place, don't neglect that environment and that infrastructure for your employees. Fostering happiness is really key to getting employees to be motivated and engaged enough to actually deliver on the promises that you're making and move up the ladder in terms of the engagement they have with your customers. Um, and it pays more than you realize. You know, that one, this one campaign we do every year helps us make sure that we're meeting our accuracy and productivity goals. At that point, you're ready to anticipate needs and give customers what they don't even know they want. Remember, it's the unexpected that delivers delight. But be sure you can experiment and pivot quickly if you find yourself with something the customers don't want. <laughs> And that's really it. So, you know, we hope that this is something that as your company grows and scales, um, whether you're at 400 already or you're just starting out in year two, that you can look to to make sure that you can create those really engaging customer experiences that are going to drive customer loyalty and growth for you as an organization. Um, we believe that by following the principles of the service pyramid, um, you will be able to continue to deliver delight no matter what um, size and scale you reach. So, thank you very thank you much. Very much. <laughs> um, Steve and I will be up here for a little while longer, and we'd also like to say if you'd like to learn more about the SIP trunking product from Twilio, we recommend um, Annie and Jake's uh, talk at 505, a global SIP platform your business can rely on. Thank you again.